anthropogenic factors, but uh, when come to the climate factor. So, if Tony would be able to elaborate. Climate factors. Yeah. Yes, especially the, the sea swelling and ocean temperature rise and ocean acidification. Those are the main three factors we can especially mention here. On the other hand, uh, when I was a child, I didn't have any idea about tornadoes in Sri Lanka. So now if you check the uh, news and weather reports, you can observe at least 100 tornado per week in Sri Lanka. That's that, that clearly say that the climate is changing. On the other hand, if you talk to fishermen, they have seen, they, they have seen, and they have observed, that, and they are always telling that the, the ocean currents are changed, the wind patterns are changed, and, and they are they can now predict the the the, they are the uh, weather or the ocean conditions like uh, like what they did earlier. So they know they know what happened during the uh, during the past decades regarding the climate change. From from scientific side, yes. Now we have observed number of unexpected and very sudden erosion c incidents around the country mainly because of those are called freak waves and freak tide conditions on the other hand the ocean swelling because where the ocean is the place the water is the one of the component that absorb heat when the when water absorb heat it expands it means the ocean is swelling so ocean because of the ocean swelling the ocean uh, the height goes up on the other hand, we know that even last week I heard uh, news about in, uh, in, in Antarctic region, about several thousand kilometers of iceberg detached from the South Pole. And also, those, those are adding fresh water. It is more water into the ocean and sea level is rising. And when the sea level is rising, when the more erosion is happening, what is happening is in the coastal areas is high amount of sediments. When there are more sediments, corals cannot handle the sediment amounts. On the other hand, when we have flash floods, high rains, more sediment is brought to the ocean through rivers, especially when you go to uh, areas like Kayankarani and even in, in Polhena. You can see how many, how much amount of sediments are brought to the ocean through the, the rivers. When you die, you can't even see your palm when you extend your hand. Such a turbid waters in coastal areas. So, corals need sunlight. Therefore, corals cannot thrive in turbid waters. And on the other hand, I earlier mentioned that the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide. So when we emit more carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide added in the ocean, and ocean becomes more acidified because of uh, what's the acid? Uh, carbon uh, the acidification. Yeah. And when more, more acidic conditions, corals cannot develop their shells. Not only corals, even even small animals, they cannot develop their uh, eggs because of the acidification condition. And when the sea level rise, the corals in the bottom areas don't get enough sunlight. They start dying from the bottom. And those are the bad impacts. But on the other hand, when, when the ocean is, uh, then the plant, is get, get, plant gets more heated, corals can now move into polar region. Those are some plus points for corals. So in the tropics, they are disappearing with the high heat conditions, but that on the other hand, corals can move into uh, polar region. They can have more areas in uh, ocean areas in, in temperate zone. So those are the things uh, we can expect through happening through climate change impacts. But in Sri Lanka, because of climate, we have observed number of uh, invasive species. They exploded in large numbers and they covered most of reefs. And corals died because of El Nino. Not only El Nino, the frequent El Nino. The first global event happened in 1981 and 2. That was not discussed heavily. But 1998 was discussed, as Arjun mentioned. Then 2010 and 2015. In 2000, 2000, 2015, about 98% of corals died in Polhead. I have published a paper on that. So you know, Posilopora, and 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 Montipora, uh, we call sometimes as a, as as pests. They spread very fast. I couldn't find one single colony of Posilopora from the entire Polhena reef. When I came back, or the just by the row, by the by the coast, smaller piece of Posilopora I found. I was so that's the situation because of the climate change. Therefore, I will talk about pollution later. 
but climate change has caused number of detrimental effects to the coral reef, but still climate change is happening and is increasing day by day. I do not think that corals have a better future. Then we have to think about that and we do something, we have to have some solution at least from scientific side, what we can plan because or at least how can, how we, how manage people we, because we cannot manage corals, but we can manage people. So, from that side also to good, uh, uh, to establish a better uh, uh, future for corals, I think we have to think and act properly. Right. So, it is very clear which means uh, even the like a remote areas in the coral reefs are dying which means that it is not only the anthropogenic, I mean the definitely climate change part is there. Right. So, so the definitely there is a, a climate cha change signatures in the uh, coral reefs. So, because this ever increase in temperature they are actually cooking the coral reefs that is what the scientists call it and uh, on the other hand the ocean acidification like they are corroding the corals right. So, that the two events actually in the same time right. So, if Nishan do you like to add something or? Pretty much I think they have covered it. Um, I think Arjun alluded to a very very important point in terms of the exports and all of that because I, I think we have a kind of cognitive dissonance. Uh, when it comes to policy decision making because oh, you can sit in a room with competing agencies when we discuss management and, and everyone is looking at the same patch of reef for the same resource with, with various conflicting uh, agendas and we are trying to find a way how everyone can uh, tick their boxes. Now, this is not how you do spatial planning because there is no way that you can, you know, when we try to do marine protected areas, Sri Lanka has very few and most of them if not all barring the bar reef are tiny. So, we are trying to do spatial planning inside a very you know a, a marine protected area that is about the size of two or three cricket grounds you know and then you want to have fishing interest, tourism interest, research uh, you know when you do spatial planning you do large areas and uh, the, I find it really kind of uh, strange that we have this entire ocean I mean what 1500 kilometers of ocean around us. And Every time we get into an area the size of a cricket ground, we are still arguing that some fisherman is losing their right. So, if we can't come to a point that we can allocate some tiny percentage as a, as a protected area, as a no-take zone, and we are looking at exploiting that bit, there is no end. We are looking at economic values. There are non-extractive economic values of potentially tourism. Now, we are, I, am, I, I don't think any of us are, and I certainly am not one of a what I would deem a tree hugging conservationist. Uh, we have to look at an economic ways, people have to use resources. Um, so, kind of coming to that point of saying look there is a resource that we have to look at sustainability and keeping certain areas and, and often the, the drive that we were talking earlier that everyone was talking about was, was it impact fisheries. Uh, we have seen the fisheries sector suffer. We have seen entire fisheries collapse, the sea cucumber fishery, we have seen other fisheries collapse. So, people are then either shifting to other resources, to other areas, using more destructive methods, they are just going. But we are kind of blind to this idea that this is not an unlimited resource. And many fishermen suffer in competition with. So, one of the issues that we face with destructive fishing often is there is this argument that, but they have livelihoods, they have families to support. Nobody is arguing for people to stop fishing, we are arguing for them to use certain methods or refrain from certain methods. And often the people using the destructive methods are doing, driving the worst fisheries are doing that at a severe cost to other fishermen mm. or fishers. And there are thousands sometimes for a hundred people to drive some big export driven industry or to use dynamite or bottom set netting. Thousands of traditional fishers who are playing by the rules who have families to maintain, who do not have the financial stability that the big export driven, business driven fishers, the commercial fishers have or subsistence fishers are losing out. Uh, the people who paddle an uh, outrigger canoe out to the reef and put a hand line, quite sustainable, uh, feeding their families as their grandfathers and parents have done. We completely ignore them and we shut them out. Just so that some, so I think this is an, an, an important debate that has to be taken like at the policy level because we always look at conservation is trying to stop something or you know we have to think of the fishes of course we all think of the fishes yeah. 
and we have to think of the people, but we are not thinking of the fishers when we do the destructive stuff. So that's I think something that really has to be pushed at the policy level. Yeah, so I just want to add that absolutely let's, I mean that's exactly the problem. I mean the big problem here is that we have all these different agencies, they're all sort of looking after the same thing and it's all so fragmented. Right? So you go into a marine protected area, you have the Department of Wildlife that's in charge of the marine protected area, but then there's a fisheries department that comes in and they are in charge of the fisheries side. So they have conflicting agenda as exactly you say, right? So we are like the struggle is like I'd say one of the big things that we can do for our sort of marine environment or whatever is having one ministry that looks after all these aspects because then you have cohesion, then you have uh, conversation at least between them, right? And that's the thing. And you know, we think about things like, you know, Sri Lanka, we love, I mean, I love Sri Lanka, don't get me wrong, but I get frustrated and I think we are all frustrated, which is why we are, there we are. But the point is, you know, you think about what a lot of noise was made when we banned bottom trawling in Sri Lanka, right? What a huge, I mean, it was in the newspapers, it went global. You ask anybody, there's plenty of bottom trawling going on. What does bottom trawling do? They just drag nets across the floor. They destroy reefs. They destroy all kinds of habitats, ecosystems that are so important. For one kilo of shrimp, you're taking out like 12 kilos of other species that die by accident, right? We don't talk about all of that. There's a certain convenience around what we celebrate and what we put out into the world. And then we don't follow up with actions. And I, that to me is really frustrating as a person who's incredibly action oriented. I think that's where we stumble because we've been fighting these things. We go into the rooms with these same people all the time. <coughs> what we do need is a lot more support from everybody else around us as well. Because you know, people like you understand these problems. So we need voices because otherwise what happens also is a lot of departments look at us like ah, it's them again. Right? We are not doing it for ourselves. I'm certainly not trying to do what I do for myself. I don't have children, so I'm not protecting the planet for my own children. I'm protecting the planet for the sake of this country, for the sake of our natural heritage in the future, for the sake of that next generation. So that's what I'm fine. So I don't, I don't have a selfish interest. Like I don't want my child to be able to see the coral reef. I want everyone to see the coral reef. And I think we should all start to think about it that way. We have a, we have duty. Right to consider, and all of these, like how do we work with these systems? Lots of people will give up because they find the political system just too frustrating. It is frustrating. I'm not going to lie, but we can't give up either, because we need some voices to keep going. And I know Arjun's been doing this for longer than all of us since he confessed longer he's the oldest on the panel. <laughs> but uh, you know, and we, we we sort of continue that fight, but. You know, we all have to, all of us who have that capacity to understand these problems need to become stronger voices um, for trying to resolve some of these problems because five people can't do it. One, adding to uh, what Asha said earlier, your students at Pigeon Island, mm. but, uh, with Dr. Mahal Pata, we used to take uh, the Jafra students to the reefs, initially at Room Asala. Initially, it was a good reef, and through the years, the reef degraded and we used to take kids to a dead reef. Nothing to show. Mm. Then uh, the war finished and like, you know, the war was one of the best things for the exactly. reefs. <laughs> and the north and east opened out and the people, which kids we used to take and show dead coral had a chance again. They were seeing good reefs, almost, you know, in very good condition. So, and now those reefs are also going the same path very soon. Uh, and um, what you see is that, why is it, I mean, I mean a place like Pigeon Islands, when you go there, most of the people who come there, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds on a weekend, they're just coming for a swim on the beach, not even a snorkel and a mask, they just come and get in the sea, have a swim and go back. So why do you need to go to Pigeon Islands to do that, or to yeah. a coral reef? We only have, you know, handful of Coral reefs left, good reefs, two or three, nothing much. So they can go anywhere else. Why, why do we have to bring them there? And the, I mean, the authorities, they're probably looking at selling a ticket, yeah. right? That's the value of it. I mean, they should be thinking about okay, preserving the reef should be a bigger uh, issue because all those boats going there, not, it's not only the people on the ground trampling the corals, but the number of boats going there, the, amount of uh, hydrocarbons that is being introduced into the water from the boat motors and the effects that is going to have on invasive species occurrence on the reef 
And we are seeing that because the, along the boat path, there is so much invasive species happening at the bottom. And that's one thing. The other thing is, I know, now, as a nation, how we think, you know, uh, ornamental fisheries. We are sending hundreds and thousands of fish out every year to, you know, fill the aquariums around the world. Money. But now that the tourism has picked up in this country, keeping those fishes on our reefs, how much more can we make? Mm. Right? I mean, you, the tourists come here to see the fish. But when, you, they, when they go into the reef, the reef is empty. Because all the fish have been sent out. So I think, you know, as a nation, we need to really think about, you know, having our priorities right. And, you know, in this context, I think, you know, we really need to cut down on the export trade and, you know, focus on building the tourism here and making that money from the fishers, keeping them here. But that will also serve the ecological functions of the reef and keep, help keep the reefs healthy also. Well said, Prasan. I think I was about to raise that question, actually, people going to for a swim in a national park, so which is uh, because with all these, uh, like even sometimes carrying some uh, shampoo or sometimes lipstick, cute, and none yeah. of them are nutrients for the corals. Uh, corals need, don't need nutrients actually. So the the other thing you raised, uh, like the these authorities, you know, the 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 fish we can eat is belong to fisheries and the, the, the don't can't belong to wildlife, and there are a lot of fish in between, and and it's so difficult, of course, to control. Uh, since we are really running out of the time, I mean, we should have given a whole day perhaps to talk about this topic. But uh, if we can move to the next, my question about the uh, the conservation effort actually. Um, so, of course, uh, there have been a lot of conservation effort from from I mean, perhaps started from the Hikadu, I guess, uh, from a long period of time, uh, and. Some of you have already involved in this. Uh, if you can share very briefly about the, the the effect you have made and and how they have successful that I mean the, the what is the situation now? If you can start with the uh, person, I know he has been doing a huge work in the Ruma cellar, uh, putting the reef back. But if you can share very very briefly on that. Well, I'll talk about uh, working with the communities basically in reef. These things, you know, there's two aspects. One is getting national parks declared and that aspect I think Ajahn would be better suitable than me to yeah, yeah, talk sure, about. Sure. Yeah. Now, this is a very tricky area to work with because working with communities, um, most of the time, uh, there's, I mean, uh, when there's a reef close to you also, sometimes the people don't really appreciate what they got. At the time when we were working in Ruma Sala, uh, the reef was good. There was a lot of stuff coming out of it. There was enough productivity. But the processes were slowly going down and when the bleaching event happened, uh, immediately you started seeing the amount of money the people were making out of the reef dropping. And that's the time you start looking at, you know, rebuilding the reef. But still, I mean, they could see the effects of, you know, how uh, you know, losing the reef is killing the economy, but they would not stop the processes of, uh, you know, harvesting it excessively. Uh, then, um, but then you have the challenge, you know, you have to look at how to do it, you know, we were looking at restoration of the reef and that aspect of it. And also, uh, in another aspect, of, uh, we were working in a place like Kalpiti, a bar reef, last couple of years. And where the community is working in a different way, you know, the community is on board with you. They are doing a good job working with you and, you know, involved in the reef. But then at that point, the uh, challenges are different because that's a reef that is farther away from the shore. And uh, at that uh, uh, situation, there are external elements. Because the reef, when it's not on your shore, there are other people who are harvesting it. So the, the, the one community is trying to preserve it. There will be others coming in and um, taking away resources. So it's a very big challenge getting everybody on board uh, to do this. Uh, the effectiveness can vary very far. You know, it will work for some time, then suddenly it will break down. Or like, uh, you know, uh, in um, 
Vijanai, sorry, Barif. Uh, we were working with the wildlife department and uh, then his project uh, doing demarcating of the bar reef, part of the bar reef, as a protected zone, as a recovery zone. Uh, but uh, work, the communities were involved, but getting the on, uh, authorities on board it becomes another challenge. Because uh, the reef is uh, far away from shore, the Department of Wildlife, who is the authority in charge of the uh, resource, is on shore 12 kilometers from the reef. Mm. Right? When there's a boat coming onto the reef, they don't see it. And uh, anybody can come there, they can do their fishing, go back. So there are challenges that need to be looked at. And you know, but uh, you know, like putting up a, maybe a point, a left point at uh, Uchimune would have solved that problem very easily. But getting to that point is very difficult in our context. Because if, it were, if they wildlife had a point at Uchimune, it's just a six minute run to the reef from the beach and they can see the reef if the boat comes in. But from uh, Kandakulia or somewhere like that, there's no chance that you can see anything and it takes one and a half hours to get to the reef from there. So that's the kind of challenge that you're facing. Thanks. I think uh, Nishan has uh, involved in uh, some restoration programs. Uh, if you can, uh, very briefly, you can uh, like, uh, elaborate on that aspect. On, on restoration? Yeah. Uh, reef restoration has been kind of a lot in the news, I think, lately. And, and uh, it's actually one of the, I would say, debatable or controversial, uh, uh, debated uh, things amongst the scientific community. Um, so here, I, I'll put my, my position on this. I think uh, reef restoration has certain applications uh, yeah. in a local context. Uh, in certain areas, restoring small areas of reefs, it can be successful. In ensuring that you create pockets of kind of uh, corals that are affected or like preserving areas, they can be uh, effective. Uh, in terms of education awareness, uh, mobilizing communities, they can be very effective. Um, the key, I think, with restoration is understanding what you can do with it and then understanding the limitations of what you can do with it. Uh, because uh, like many debates in the world, you have an extreme far left and a far right. Either you are with us or you are against us. I think the, the, the reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think in certain areas, coral reef restoration can have definitely positive impacts. What we have to understand is that uh, we are not going to restore you know, a thousand kilometers of reef uh, manually. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not going to bring the bar reef back purely from restoring. Uh, when we talk about restoration, there's also many things. Uh, often what people refer to is literally physically transplanting corals. Yeah. So transplanting corals, we are not going to reseed like, I don't know, you know, large areas of reefs. Uh, so I think as long as you keep, keep that in mind, uh, it's it's good. So right now we have been kind of looking at some corals that we've been playing around in a kind of research. I mean primarily I'm a researcher so my focus is more understanding these ecosystems because we need a little bit better science for management. Mm, uh, we've played around with uh, moving certain corals that seem to be doing better with bleaching uh, and I can say now in Pasikuda that some corals we moved uh, from one part of the reef that mm didn't seem to be bleaching much or recovered very fast uh, to another section where now last month when I went everything has died. The only corals that were alive <laughs> were the transplanted fragments. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that the, it, it could be a genetic uh, <coughs> variation, it could be so this is again we need to study more. Yeah, I think so they, they can be quite useful in, in doing this and they might be you know if you do it at a scale enough for a small area like in a Pascura reef you might be able to provide kind of larval recruits and other stuff through these little communities. So they, they can definitely have applications, but it's very, very important to bear in mind what your limitations are. Uh, exactly. Like I, I think mm -hmm. I, it's well understood like whether the, the, the reason where is always is still there, the, the reason for coral to die. So no matter how hard we try, 
exactly. still there that's called as unless you address those chronic problems yep. it's like if it's not a chronic problem then maybe in certain areas it can be so yes, it's that's, that's again right. why you say research with everything it's important that whatever you do has a scientific base and you understand these things so doing at a small scale understanding the process and then looking at what you can expand and the limitations is important uh, but before that uh, if you can come to the dr turney like now climate change of course the one uh, stress on the other hand the pollution especially from the land based <coughs> pollution to the marine environment is from plastic to nutrients to the sediment i think the, that also a major part so from you are from the marine environment protection authorities so like what kind of a plans or what kind of things you are doing for them on to control that issue of course i know it's so difficult but but <coughs> regarding <laughs> regarding marine pollution don't think that you are not polluting the ocean wherever you are living even if you are living in kandy kurnagar there you are contributing you are polluting the ocean one way or another therefore we are polluters all of us are contributing for that <coughs> in sri lanka in, in generally about 80% of pollutants are coming from the land based sources even from your kitchen you are contributing when you wash your hand after your meals you are contributing this those tiny particles of oil is ultimately added to the coastal waters therefore when we do especially the reef cleanups and beach cleanups we collect garbage in tons right <coughs> not in in bags but we collect them in tons so the pictures you show is nothing for me but the the um, amount of garbage i am handling for the moment though we are not supposed to but we are doing it and on one hand we can control garbage to to be uh, before adding it by establishing strainers across small streams we have established the, those strainers in trincomalee even valvata canal there will be a strainer coming and even across um, Kalil Kalil River. There will be two strainers come to trap garbage from that point and take it out from uh, and uh, send it to the uh, recycling centers. But that's not that's not the problem. But this, the the liquid waste is a most strictly problem we are having for the moment. You should know that the all the toilets we are using in Colombo, the sewage is pumped untreated to the coastal waters in Colombo. Not only here. hikka do the same or not the same so in japan about 97% of sewage is treated only 3% is untreated the totally waste was in the can in sri lanka about only 3% is treated and 97% is untreated and pumped to the ocean and and again we are talking about uh, new projects are coming so whenever we take this issues at government meetings level they said okay we are we having plans and we have lots of projects are coming through lots of uh, diplomatic sources but it will take some more at least 2 3 decades time because connecting all the toilets to one sewer to, uh, to one single sewer system is time taking and very uh, high cost involved therefore that's a one of the issues we are facing for, for the moment that the the liquid liquid based not only sewers pharmaceutical residuals and and agrochemicals what the chemical the amount of chemicals you are using at household level even insecticides in those are ultimately added to the ocean so we can't filter them simply so what we are do is we have to think about that that we have to admit that we are also polluting the ocean we are also contributing for the coral deaths so understand that because in sri lanka we are very much in very much advanced fighting for our rights but we have always forgot about our our duties as sri lankans so there's a culture we have to inculcate in our minds to that mindset we can reduce our carbon footprint to helping coral reefs on the, on the other hand for at at present the planet needs about 3 trillion trees to control pollution the control the global warming and keep the the warming at 1% degree level Three trillion trees. At least individually, we have to plant individually more than hundred trees if you want to go to that level target. So we have to understand that because I think we can think about others. Others will come and do protect our reefs, but on the on the other hand, we also have some stake in our hand. If we can understand that, if we can do that, I can we can do something. 
So ultimately, the, the community effect will be to serve the global level at larger scale. Therefore, I think from the government side, we have from uh, from EPA side, we have taken some policy decisions to create uh, ocean pollution free ocean by 2030. We have a third uh, ten years plan. We have uh, established a new uh, policy for towards uh, the pollution control for fisheries sector. And we have uh, from international side, we have became uh, members members of member for ocean uh, UN ocean clean ocean uh, campaign. And for the last UNEA, we uh, co-sponsored for five resolutions. One is on plastic, uh, microplastic. One is on um, uh, solid waste. So we are having, we, we are acting on all these levels. So what we really, we really need is from the from the bottom up level, from community to take this up, the individuals to take take it up. Because we talk about CSR, community social responsibility. We have always forgot about individual social responsibility. IESR, what I can do to the to the society and to the to the environment to the coral reef at the end. I think if we can think about that, if we can work for that, as whole we can do something. At the, on the other hand, as a government agency, we are doing a lot. I can list it. I am doing it here. But there are lots of things are happening. But we can't think. Don't think of others. Let's do something. And that tiny commitment is enough. That's what I really expect from you. The yeah, next question I was about to ask about the like uh, research gaps, but uh, really don't have the time to go into that. But uh, I mean, definitely that is one of the issues. If you go to uh, Australia, Barif, you will have thousands, even ten thousands of research papers to understand the issue at least. Of course, it's still the corals dying, but that is different. But at least they have understanding the, what is uh, happening. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, like, I was searching in the Google Scholar, like uh, how many index papers on coral reefs, <coughs> very few, some of the Arjun's work and some of your work, but very few works has been done, so that we, which means we do not have really very good understanding. Uh, there is a big uh, gap in the research part as well, which we need to perhaps uh, need to address something, but uh, uh, so by now we know that is the corals playing a long game, right. So, so we are, so we have to do that uh, play a long game as well. So I wanted to call each panelist to like uh, very briefly uh, put some idea about uh, what to do, what, what should we do ahead. So what is really we have to do in the future, like if you can give a few thoughts about that. Um, for start uh, from Arjun. So what, what should we really do? I mean, the corals are dying, so should we lay, wait and see? Or oh, what is your opinion? The way I see this is that uh, there was an indication uh, that uh, the management should come together because so long as individuals are trying to manage this, it's difficult. Uh, so that is one aspect of it. And then the, uh, the, the main issue is that uh, now if you want to protect at least some areas, then the way forward is creating marine protected areas. And creating that also has several important aspects to think about. Now, I think most people don't know that that certain types of fish, they come together swimming over vast distances to breed together. Most animals in the sea are broadcast spawners. That is, they send out their gametes into the water so that you maximize the distribution of the larvae. And they all come together and we are very smart in determining when they come together and we catch the entire shoal. So that's, as, as Tony was saying, we are also contributing to eating them. <laughs> Maybe even for lunch today. <laughs> so, so these are aspects that we need to actually address. Because when we talk of coral reefs, I must say here that I highlighted that we have only a small amount of corals 
but we do have vast amount of reefs around us, but they are not 100% coral. They are old limestone, sandstone reefs that have formed, maybe with coral or beach rock, over changing sea levels. So if you look at the bathymetric charts around Sri Lanka, you have a large number of reefs. They are not all coral, but they are the habitats of all these fish, reef fish or demersal fish, which we call bottom dwelling fish. So they all need to be protected. For the moment, we are concentrating mainly on coral habitats because most of the coral reefs around Sri Lanka, the de declared protected areas are centered around coral. But we also need to capture large areas that have these other habitats that are linked habitats that maintain the coral. Because some of these fish in the deep reefs, they are young, are in the shallow coral. So protecting only one place doesn't work. Just like the shrimps. The shrimps we eat, they are larvae in the, in the lagoons, in the mangroves and the seagrass. But the adults get out to sea to spawn. So all these, the connectivity is very important to understand. This is not understood very well by most people. So, so connectivity, understanding connectivity is very, very important. Prasanna brought up the involvement of the communities, which is also very important because we haven't given enough empowerment to these communities. You know, the authorities stand on one side, the communities stand on the other side. So it is very important that you have an inclusive process where you bring in the people who are involved in harvesting into the management process. It is only then that you begin to make a change. So these are my thoughts that uh, the way forward, but I know that it is very difficult in Sri Lanka to bring the communities into the, because we have a management system which is very, very anti uh, user groups so, so they are not easily absorbed and we also like to hang on to power mm. so we <laughs> don't bring in the users into the picture so so long as we continue like that we will continue to have these problems but what I see is that the larger picture with climate change and everything that we discussed is happening but at the same time the bits that we can do is to actually change human behavior. Mm. If we change human behavior, and Tony very correctly pointed out that we must accept the responsibility and that we certainly play a part in this whole game. So uh, I think that needs to be the, the key in, in, the, in, the, in the way forward. This is my understanding of this, uh, looking at it from a kind of a holistic approach. Well thought. Thank you. For one, I believe that restoration has a role to play in this, in the survival of coral reefs on several uh, these things. Because you know, uh, when you s the biggest uh, issue is that at the moment when we talk about restoration, a lot of people think it's coral reef planting. That's not the case. You can't start from there. Reef restoration is you need to identify the needs of the each reef and then look at it because you know sometimes one of the biggest uh, you know problems in reef restoration or you know survival of reefs right now is not the availability of coral larvae but substrates for it to grow mm. because the reefs have died and the coral has broken into rubble and it's not a stable substrate anymore for the reef to recover so then the restoration is basically not replanting coral it should be sub you know providing good habitat good substrates on the reef for it to grow. So restoration has a role to play. It uh, is a you know, big process. It's a much bigger process than what people normally think about. You know, first you have to identify the threats that's there, try to get those out of the way. And then uh, maybe it's the invasive species that you need to manage or providing solid substrates for the recovery of the corals. Then as a last resort, you come into replanting corals. Uh, that also, if there is no natural recurrent, you know, enough uh, natural 
recovery happening. But then again, replanting corals means you need to have material to take from. If there's not enough material at that reef, is there a place where you can get it? Can, it get, can you get it safely? So these are big questions. Because you, don't, you, you can't uh, risk losing more coral. Because you have a very small amount of coral remaining. In the translocation, if you uh, kill coral, that's going to be a much bigger problem. So you need to look at that. But also another aspect to this is the pattern that we are seeing is you have some reefs remaining, but on one year, one of the reefs will get completely decimated. But the next reef survives. So what if the same thing happens to the next reef the next year? We are losing that diversity also. So maybe this restoration can be a tool where you can, you know, keep your you know, eggs yeah. spread around, you know, where, yeah. where, you know, if one reef goes, there'll be a species surviving in the next for it to come back. Uh, the, the, from a restoration point, one of the big discussions now among scientists is uh, the importance of certain kind of pockets of biodiversity or, or genetic material, basically, that, that carrying out certain activities, restoration or human-induced activities will help support kind of little sub pockets uh, which might then help the natural recovery so that in that case like that these are the applications and like I said we definitely have to do it with a lot more research that's that's the important thing because what people have to understand is it's complex there's a lot of research that goes into it to do that but just to to close with um, touching with what Arjun says this whole management process I think one of the key issues I see is that we are stuck in a project mentality I think every big conservation initiative or management initiative is we have a big grant, we have a three-year management cycle. Usually by the time we finish the management plan in three years, we have a big book and then we have no money to implement it. So there is no sustainability into it. Um, so we are not looking at the complete process, whether it's financing, uh, who is continuing activities. And we are, in my opinion, many of these problems to some degree have simple solutions we overcomplicate things. You know, even with these agency mandates, I think we overcomplicate it. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, there are much simpler solutions. Uh, we need to, you know, again, empowering communities is not only getting them into a committee as we do. We have community coordinating committees and people come and voice their opinion. But the decision making enforcement is stuck somewhere else. So if you go and ask the enforcement authorities why they don't enforce, so they will say we have a lack of capacity. So then we have a discussion, why don't we give this out and co-manage? No, 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 we have to do the management. Why don't you do it? We have a lack of capacity. So this is, you know, a vicious cycle. And this is not rocket science. This is done in developing countries because most coral reefs are in the tropical world, barring, say, Australia and a part of the US. The rest are all in third world countries. So these countries have very successful co-management processes where the community are involved in patrolling, enforcing, together with the management authorities. That is co-management, not just having someone part of a community committee, but has no control over what. So you're not empowering and you're not seeing tangible benefits to the local community. So even if you have tourism or whatever, you have to ensure. If you have marine park fees that are collected, I think this is a conservation problem in Sri Lanka, <laughs> mm -hmm. where does this money go? Mm -hmm. We can't get a boat or engine to do something in the reef, but we are collecting a million rupees every day. At least a percentage of this. Uh, we don't want a hundred percent. So I think uh, you have to change this. Without doing this, we are flogging a dead horse. And, and just to conclude, I will stop on that because everything is covered by everyone else. <laughs> we, we will complain and we will show our frustration. But you only do that for what you love. You discipline your kids because you love them. <laughs> you complain because you care. Because there are lots of things we don't spend time complaining about because, you know, we can't be bothered about. So we do care. Uh, unfortunately, you're often seen as someone upsetting the apple cart when you complain, but, but we are we're there because we care. And we, we can, if, a, if we can show some difference before and after, something tangible. Therefore, we, we stop publishing books and reports from me per side. Now we, we need programs where we can show for change. So all the programs we have plans for the, for the moment is based on that main concept. 
on the other hand from from top down level i think for by today we have about 23 marine parks and five on in the pipe so we have to do something to take them out of that paper park concept what is happening on the ground because if you enter a marine park in in other country you feel it you have to follow some strict guidelines and rules but in here you can do anything and everything in our marine parks we have deviate from that side and from the pollution control we have to act very strictly from government side also we ban plastics and shopping bags but still we have something some more to do and regarding dynamite fishing blast fishing still is happening in most of the places so those we have to stop or regulate for some level and uh, again as asha mentioned to take all the uh, the stakeholders to one single that overarching system you say in china they have in australia they have and at la and the end the country should have a marine special planning program because other countries they have a marine special programs they have planned marine uh, ecosystem and they know what to do in where what to do where but in sri lanka we don't have such a program i i, I took this for last couple of years in lots of forums still nobody has heard it so therefore with that Uh, points. If we can take top down and we can take the bottom up, as I mentioned earlier, we can do something. But still, we always think about to do something that is tangible and that is practical oriented. So without that concept, I think we won't be able to do a, a fair uh, support for the coral reefs. I would say the other problem we have in Sri Lanka is that we uh, like to please the water base. So I'd say that's one of our big issues. Mm -hmm. so we are afraid to i mean the thing is we we don't want to include communities because they are too poor but then there's this like there's a, a middle man who controls things financially or whatever who then becomes a, the strong voice that controls a lot what of what happens now as for example like in in a place like you know there was a collapse of cod fisheries in canada many many years ago and they closed down the fishery and there was a huge outcry because all these fishermen overnight had no work right and it was the same kind of argument with here here it's like what about their livelihoods what about their children they got really aggressive all of this but the government stood their ground they said if there's a collapse if we don't shut it now we're never going to have any more cod right so then they did and over time through education awareness and also being inclusive with those fishermen they start to see this recovery of this fishery right so what would happen here unfortunately and i mean i'm saying this out of the experience that i've had is that this if the fishermen came and shouted then we'd be like ah okay better not do anything because they won't vote for me in the next cycle right i'm being very honest here this is how things happen i mean you know i to me it's just frustrating and these are the things that we should all be aware of that what we battle okay and so as nishan says like these are not i mean not like sri lanka is in a special country and we are in third world and we should feel sorry for ourselves because coral reefs are in like third world countries right and so that's something that we all know and um, there is a there's a thing called the natural systems approach where you're actually valuing the reefs but also dependencies and in in say for example in a place like palawan in uh, philippines they did a study and the fishermen first were like really upset because now they're like well they might close down my our fishery and stuff and and this reef area and they didn't want it closed down because they wanted tourism and they actually found that co management was the best thing because the community knew what the need was but the government also had the best interest in terms of the long term vision right because communities can also often you know human beings are such that we we run on like our short term needs as much as we like to say think about your children your children's children often times we are running on what makes our lives comfortable and so in this sense you know the government should have a long term vision for the country for the nation and then you accommodate these other voices into that conversation because that's really important you can't go anywhere if you're not including people and and as everyone said the conservation is 99% managing humans it's not about like an an species or an ecosystem it's management of the people around it and so that's i think we need to shift out the way we deal with these issues as well in that sense and then i am firm believe in education i think you shouldn't learn about the word conservation and sustainability when you're 19 and only if you're in a job that re, uh, revolves around those fields why are kids in our schools why are we talking i mean if you if you look at a textbook do we even talk about the ocean in our textbooks right it's 
we have eight times more ocean area than land area in this country. But it does not feature. These concepts are alien. We know, we talk about sustainability and conservation like it's an everyday term because we live in this tiny bubble. But everybody should be having these conversations from the time they are young. It should be ingrained that by the time you are older, you are ready to act. Otherwise, you have this like you come out of school, then you learn about the word, then you are trying to figure out how to use the word, then you are figuring out how to make the difference. By that time, you know, you're way down the line. So, you know, th there's a whole systems change in so many ways that has to happen. Um, and I think if we get inculcate uh, kids at a young age, we're going to get there a little bit faster than we are right now because adults are just so happy to live selfish lives. And I mean, let's be honest, we are all like that, right? We all have an impact. We all continue with our lives as much as we are aware. We make small changes, but we still, but now the power of the voice is in the youth. And for too long, we have talked about how experience is the most important thing. It's not, right? Passion and a desire to make change is all that matters. It doesn't matter what your age, your background or your gender. You just have to want to care. And so I think like, education is a, has a huge role to play in shifting what's going on right now. Kamal, one single last point. In Canada, they start teaching environmental ethics and social ethics from kindergarten. Right? In, in our system, we are not taught, we are, we are not learning ethics even at university, university mm. levels until they come to fourth year. Right? They are, that's a place they are very strong. We have to teach our kids ethics, social ethics and environmental ethics, then we are, that's the place we, are, we, we can take the turn. They have to, someday, we won't be here, but some, someday it, the country will come to a real path. Thank you very much for sharing your very, your, all the knowledge and especially the experience you had. Uh, on behalf of the, the organizing committee, I really thank you all.